Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Arthritis in the Workplace Employee Rights and Ergonomics webinar. My name is Shannon Young, and I am a human resources professional. And I'm also someone that's been living with rheumatoid arthritis um, for about 25 years. Um, as an HR specialist and someone living with arthritis, I do understand the challenges both physically and professionally that arthritis can present at work. Tonight, myself, along with two other guests, will share ways to manage arthritis-related work difficulties, including how to obtain accommodations and ergonomic solutions to help relieve joints and make tasks more accessible. Before we get started, we're gonna take care of a few housekeeping items for tonight's uh, presentation. We have already muted all attendees for this event but you can direct any questions or thoughts you may have throughout the presentation to the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom frame screen. We will start with presentations and then move on to a Q&A. And after tonight's session, you will receive an email asking about your experience. These surveys help us at the foundation better plan for future events. So please do take the time to fill them out. A recording of tonight's event will also be included in the second post-event survey email, as well as be available on the Arthritis Foundation's YouTube channel and webinars hub about a week after this event. You can also register for upcoming webinars, which are hosted monthly on the webinars hub. Let's get started by introducing our guests for tonight's presentation. Laura Boslau, is a civil rights and equal employment opportunity professional with the Missouri Department of Transportation. Ms. Boslow also lives with arthritis herself and intimately understands workplace struggles and how to advocate for equal protection. As a civil rights specialist with the Missouri Department of Transportation, she certifies and assists minority and female owned firms in the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program. In her past position as an Equal Opportunity Compliance Officer, Ms. Boslow ensured that programs were compliant to equal employment opportunity laws, monitored contractors for compliance, and provided guidance to the board in equal opportunity matters. She also trained staff in disability accommodations, areas of discrimination, employment laws, family medical leave, and other areas of equal employment opportunity. Nikki Weiner, Dr. Nikki Weiner, my apologies, is a licensed occupational therapist, lead ergonomic specialist, and president of the Rising Workplace. She leads a team of ergonomic specialists who provide services globally. Trained as a certified ergonomic specialist, Dr. Weiner performs ergonomic assessments, consulting, and training in a wide variety of workplaces from the single home office to large industrial facilities. Her work centers on the dynamic relationship between personal, environmental, and occupational factors in the workplace with outcomes focused on employee engagement, performance, and well-being. Dr. Weiner's other professional roles have included clinical education, research, and practice in the adult rehabilitation field. We'll let uh, Laura get it kicked off for us. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, I am happy to be here. Uh, so just a little bit about who am I. Um, I'm a wife, mother, I'm a grandmother. Um, I'm a daughter of a mother who had multiple sclerosis and sarcoidosis. And that's where I learned about uh, disability advocacy. I'm a juvenile uh, idiopathic or rheumatoid arthritis patient. Um, my work career is focused on disability and advocacy. And I am a member of the PR Coin Parent Working Group. Um, for care and improvement outcomes for pediatric rheumatology. And I'm also a parent patient representative with CARA, which is the um, research for juvenile arthritis. Um, so tonight's objectives um, are talking about what laws apply to disability and reasonable accommodations with employment. So those are section 503 and 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, those mostly will apply if you work in government employment, um, workplace protections under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and then some resources um, to assist you. Um, next slide, please. 
So what laws protect me? So the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, or the AD Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act, um, these provide uh, coverage for reasonable accommodations for applicants and employees with disabilities, and they prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability in all aspects of employment. So reasonable accommodation that can include uh, restructuring of job, making work sites and workstations accessible, modifying schedules, providing services such as interpreters, modifying equipment, but also mainly it has to do with modifying policies um, as well. Um, and there's some Title I coverages and Title II coverages when it comes to uh, disability and reasonable accommodations. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, uh, mainly Section 504, but also Section 503. So what can the ADA actually do for you? So employers are not required to provide accommodations that would would impose an undue hardship on the company or extreme financial burden. Um, I do want to point out that that has been a very difficult um, thing for businesses to prove in the courts that something is an undue hardship, um, but the language is in the law. Um, but they, it can lower production standards, provide um, personal need items such as medical equipment, um, but that essential job function, you do still have to be able to perform the essential functions of a job. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go on. Um, but the uh, employer must be able, or the employee must be able to fulfill functions of the job in question. So that's what the essential, essential functions of a job means. This does apply to companies with 15 or more employees. That was kind of the government's give on the small businesses that could be a, a hardship for small businesses to comply. Um, so employers who have fewer employees don't have to provide reasonable accommodations. However, many will, um, and I'll get into the reasons for that as we go on. And the next slide is that um, what does reasonable accommodation mean? So reasonable accommodation is any change in the environment on the way things are done that enables an individual with a disability to enjoy equal opportunities at work. These could be, like I mentioned before, just a change in policy. It could be providing um, accessible materials. It could be making sure that the person's workspace is ergonomic for them. And it can also include leave. So there are different different ways it can be achieved because the law language is vague regarding specific disabilities and what those reasonable accommodations are. It provides a, a huge um, way in those, in the way someone could be accommodated. So it doesn't really limit it. And so that's really one of the good things about the law. So there, are, you know, you do have that undue hardship um, exception. But like I said, that's been really hard for businesses uh, many times to prove in court. Um, and so it's, it's really something not to be too concerned about if you are. But some examples of reasonable accommodations could be as simple as food and water at your workstation for someone who has, um, say, diabetes or um, other health conditions that can impact their um, digestive system. Um, bathroom access. Many of us who have arthritis issues also have um, gastrointestinal issues as well. Um, parking access, having a close parking spot to your um, building entrance. Um, lighting. Um, I don't if you're like me, you also have migraine issues. So um, types of lighting can trigger can trigger migraines. So it can be as simple as changing light bulbs. Um, a later start time. That's a big um, need for people who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other arthritis issues because you're stiff and more painful in the morning, um, as well as flexible schedules, flexing time out for appointments. Um, you can work a little extra on one day so you can leave earlier the next for your appointment. Um, even as simple as being able to store ice packs in the freezer at work. Um, I have several ice packs in our uh, break room freezer that I can grab as needed. Um, accommodations for shoes, if your workplace requires specific shoe wear, 
um, and even sun protective clothing for people who do a lot of work outdoors. Um, a lot of our medications do make us more photosensitive. So those are just some ideas of what accommodations can look like. Um, but the ones I talked about, some of them may have costs, but a lot of them do not. Um, next slide, please. So most accommodations really don't cost the business anything. That's when, like I mentioned, um, al making allowances for policies with the company because someone has um, need for it. So 59% of requested accommodations, um, research has shown don't cost anything to the employer. Um, however, some do. And if they do, businesses can also uh, qualify for some tax incentives. Um, one is called the WATSI uh, credit. It's the Workforce Opportunities Tax Credit. So there are different things that employers can do. Um, and also vocational rehabilitation can be a good resource. And in a later slide, um, I have more information on, on that. Okay, so next slide. Um, the big question is, how do I request accommodations? What do I have to do? Who do I have to talk to? Um, so I encourage people to first learn what the interactive process is. And um, so what that is, is that is the process that you follow when you're requesting accommodation. Um, you're gonna see on this slide where I have, um, it should say askjan.org. And if you take nothing else from this presentation today, I want you to remember A-S-K-J-A-N, that's for ask the job accommodations network.org. And they have an amazing resource, well, lots of amazing resources, but one is on um, what your responsibilities are in the job accommodations process. And so, what you would first do is you would notify your employer. You can do that by email, you can do that in person, um, but you need to find out who to talk to. Now I'm going to say it with caution that many, many supervisors have absolutely no idea about reasonable accommodations just flat out, they're going to be um, just not know what you're talking about. So HR is generally your best, um, your best bet to start with. So you can reach out to, you know, you can talk to your manager first and see what they say. But a lot of times, like I said, they're, they're not going to be very well versed in it. So if you talk to your HR department, and you tell them that you have a physical condition that requires reasonable accommodations and you would like to start the accommodations process. Um, that meeting, they'll probably set up a meeting in person with you to talk and to kind of figure out what your needs may be and how they can best accommodate you. They may and can require a doctor's note um, to document that you do have a qualifying disability. Um, so your doctor, they may ask that they fill out a form with some of what your needs may be. Rheumatologists should be very well versed in filling this out. Um, you do not have to disclose everything in this meeting, only the things that may affect your direct job functions. Um, because you can always expand them later if you need more reasonable accommodations. So go with what your comfort zone is. Um, this is still your protected health information and you do have a right to privacy with some of it. But if you're asking for accommodations, you do have to make sure that your doctor completes something. Um, so you would then negotiate with this interactive process. Um, your employer does not have to give you everything that you ask for. Um, what they will do is they will say, okay, we can do this when you say you express that your need is um, a more ergonomic workspace. They may say, well, we'll have so-and-so come look at it. You could ask, can I have an occupational therapist? And we're going to learn more about that later. Um, come and evaluate it. Or if your employer is like mine, they actually contract with an outside company that will come and do an evaluation um, and make recommendations. Um, so you, when they say that they can do X, Y, or Z, you do have to try it. If it doesn't work, then you come back and you say, I'm sorry, that didn't work. Can we try something else? It really does help if you can give recommendations for things that have worked for you, maybe things that work for you at home. 
Um, if you have like a desk set up or in driving, it just really depends on what your uh, work is. Um, so if for some reason you are getting pushback, um, always just start taking it up the chain. I also do recommend that with every um, contact you have, with every meeting that you have, if they are not following up with something in writing, that you are following up with an email. Because then you are tracking and um, you have a trail so that if for some reason they decide that they can't won't offer you or can't because of undue hardship, you have things in writing that you've done and that they have done or haven't done. Um, because if for some reason you have to then take this up higher, maybe to the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, or um, you know, if, you, if someone decides to go the legal way, they need to have documentation so that you can show that you did your parts in the um, interactive process. And I know that is a lot of information. Um, so the next slide is actually a picture of my own workspace. Um, so you're gonna see um, on this picture um, from the left to the right, I have a wonderful ergonomic chair that adjusts in like 13 different ways. Um, I have a document holder so that I don't have to look down at things. I can look at them straight on. Um, in front of my keyboard is what's called a roller mouse. Um, so I, while I have a mouse, uh, standard mouse next to it, this roller mouse keeps it so I don't have to move my arms. Um, I do have issues with my shoulders and my neck and my elbows. So um, this just makes it so I have fewer movements. Um, I also, let's see, what's on my list there. I've got stress balls there to help uh, exercise my hands. Um, up above my workspace, I have a rear view mirror. Um, I do have a neck fusion, so I can't turn very easily. Um, so that makes it easier for me to see if someone's behind me. Um, my desktop is um, adjustable. I can stand or sit. I've got three different settings I'll use with it uh, throughout the course of the day. I do have speech to text software installed on my computer. Um, so that when my hands are really bad, I can just talk into it and it'll um, uh, type for me. Um, in, underneath the desk, I have a foot rest to um, help keep my uh, feet elevated a little bit so that I'm sitting with good posture. Um, and then in a drawer behind me that you can't see, I do have a heated blanket. And uh, most of us with any kind of arthritis know that heat is a very beneficial um, thing. So on those days when I'm really struggling, I can pull that heated blanket out and just be kind of nice and cozy. Um, all right, so the next slide. Some other uh, ways that um, I am accommodated and that um, I recommend people um, ask for is leave as needed. Um, this can be used for medical appointments, hospitalization if it's necessary, physical therapy appointments, others. This is covered. A lot of um, employers will push for the FMLA, which is great because it um, protects your uh, job position if you have to take leave. And you can take intermittent leave is what a lot of um, employers will kind of bulk on. They don't realize I can use, you know, half a day a week or, you know, two days later or a whole week later, I don't have to use FMLA all at once. Um, but you can, are also entitled to leave under the ADA. Um, and that is not defined, it's not limited like the FMLA, but if for some reason you would exhaust FMLA, you can request leave under the ADA. Um, for me, I request, a, we have uh, pool cars at work and when I have to drive somewhere, I request a small SUV so that I don't have to get in a car where I sink down um, so that it's difficult for me to get out. Um, if I have to travel three hours or more away, um, instead of traveling all in the same day, they uh, will accommodate me by getting me a hotel room. Um, I can work from home um, when I need to. I worked from home for an extended period, um, longer than my coworkers did um, due to the concerns with COVID. And when I returned, I had an air purifier and they changed the path of travel so that people didn't just stroll by my um, cubicle. Um, no one had to walk as far. I was at the end of the course per se. So it just kind of protected so that I didn't have any additional exposure. Uh, next slide, please. 
So questions that you may consider um, when it comes to workplace accommodations is first of all, do I have to disclose my disability? And if so, how and when is the best time? First off, if you are not asking and you don't need any reasonable accommodations, you do not have to disclose your disability at any time. Um, however, if you need some accommodations, then you would. Um, I don't recommend um, disclosing at the time of application or interview because if you don't need them, it just protects you a little bit. If you do need accommodations completing the application or in the interview process, then you do disclose. Um, if you're working or applying for a company that is a government contractor, they will um, annually uh, ask all of their employees if they would like to disclose having a disability because they do have percentages that the government sets as goals for how many employees they have have with disabilities. So it is completely up to you unless you're asking for an accommodation. Um, what questions can be asked during an interview and do I have to answer? Um, so when it comes to interviewing for a job, um, they can ask if you can um, complete or if you're able to do the necessary aspects, they'll give you a um, list of necessary job functions. And they can ask, they will ask, can you complete these with or without accommodations? You at that time, hopefully before the interview, you've looked at the job description, you figured out what you might need an accommodation with. A lot of places want you to be able to lift 50 pounds. I don't know very many places, especially um, unless you're doing like heavy construction or janitorial work, or um, you're working in a warehouse where you would have to lift 50 pounds. But an accommodation could be to team lift. So um, be thinking about, okay, yeah, I could come. So yes, I could perform those job functions. And, but you do have to answer that question if you wanna be considered for the job. Um, but that's it. They can't ask you if you, they, if you have a disability. Now, if they're like vocational rehabilitation, if they're an organization that has a grant from them that they have to have a certain percentage of people who work for them who have disabilities, then you make that decision whether or not you have you want to disclose at that time. So it's kind of nuanced, um, but um, those are the only times that I would disclose at interview. Um, do I need to have a certain type of arthritis or severity to qualify? If your arthritis impacts the daily living activities, then you are a qualified person with a disability. Now, keep in mind, if you have any type of autoimmune arthritis, your arthritis is, um, it's your immune system and it's a bodily function. So it automatically qualifies under the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act as a um qualified person with a disability. Um, if you need training or job supports, um, you ask your company. But if you need training to get the kind of job that you want, please go to your state division of vocational rehabilitation. And you can Google um, your state name, vocational rehabilitation, and their office will come up. They can provide you with job training. Um, so that you can get a job that you can do, perform. Sometimes um, our arthritis changes what we can do in life and we have to change jobs. And that would be where you could get some um, job training. They will pay for usually up to a bachelor's degree. Um, unless you can't work in your bachelor's degree field anymore, then they may consider um, a higher degree field for you. Um, but they'll pay for, um, you know, like 12 or one year certificates and they'll pay for um, college. Um, what makes an accommodation unreasonable? Um, well, um, with the courts, we're really not sure um, because it would have to be of great expense to the company. We're talking more than several thousand dollars, um, which most, I mean, even with all of the things I have on my desk, it did not run more than $3,000. My chair was kind of pricey, but I could live in that chair. Um, so what about health or life insurance? Well, thankfully with the ACA, you can get health insurance. Um, life insurance, um, you know, you, you do have to um, list a few health um, issues with some life insurance policies. 
Um, but if it's employer sponsored, you shouldn't have to. Um, I didn't have to disclose anything for my employer uh, life insurance or health insurance. Um, what if I, let's see, what should I do if my pain gets so bad that I can't do my job? Um, if your pain gets really bad, what can your employer do to help accommodate you? Can you uh, work a shortened um, schedule? Can you work from home? Can you take a break? I have talked to a company that provided a recliner in someone's office so that they could take a break. Um, if you can't do, really can't do the job that you're doing, you try different accommodations and nothing works, um, then, you know, the option for other job training or, um, you know, some people do choose to go the route of disability. Um, so there's social security disability, your employer may provide long-term disability. Um, I, I really do recommend that people really just try to, um, do all the accommodations that they can. Um, does the ADA apply to those who permanently work from home? Of course, uh, you're still an American citizen and you're still working for an employer and um, it would apply, definitely. Um, so if you needed some adaptive equipment at home to be able to do your job, um, your employer, you know, work with them to see what what the two of you together can come up with. Um, there's, there's really no, um, there's no limit um, an employer can spend everything that they would like to, but they may eventually say that it's, they've done enough. So it just really kind of depends. And like I said, vocational rehabilitation is also able to provide some um, equipment in that for accommodations. So you can always reach out to them as well. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so if you want, um, if you're capable, please take a screenshot of these links that I have on here. Um, the first one is a great uh, list of ADA employment resources. The second is that link for the askjan.org website I talked about. Um, it does have lists of accommodations by conditions. So you could actually look up accommodations specific for arthritis. Um, I will say that um, they have free and confidential um, advice lines. So you can text, email, or call them, and you can talk to one of their representatives. This is a government-funded um, website. Um, so this they know all the laws. Um, so they're an excellent resource, but they're also there for employers as well. So if your employer's not sure what they need to do, they can call or look on the website and um, find all their information. Um, but just remember, www.askjan.org. That is the best resource I can recommend. Um, the other is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, EEOC. The, each state has a Human Rights Commission and they can um, help with um, complaints. If you are um, wanting to file a disability complaint, they can assist with that. Um, your state vocational rehabilitation agencies. This is a link that gives you um, the uh, website that lists each state's rehab, voc rehab office by their website. So you can find for all of the states. Um, and then the final one is a Department of Labor pocket guide to reasonable accommodations. It really just breaks it down step by step and um, makes it easy to understand. Um, and then the, my final slide is my email address. Um, I am more than happy to answer questions if you have any. Um, please just you know use it responsibly, and um, I am more than happy to uh, answer something. Just uh, title it with ADA question, um, so that it doesn't get lost in all those other emails that we tend to accumulate. And I thank you so much for, for attending this evening and, and letting me present to you. Thank you. Dr. Weiner. it's all yours. Hi, I'm, you guys can call me Nikki. I'm a licensed occupational therapist. I work within the realm of workplace accommodations and performing ergonomic assessments, but I also perform all types of customized training and consultation related to making jobs better for humans. So let's get right into this and learn more about ergonomic solutions for work. So what is ergonomics? I love to use this kind of classical occupational therapy model to describe it. It has to do with the science of fitting the job and the environment to the person in order to 
improve performance and safety. Um, so performance is, of course, maybe the job oriented outcome, but also we can think about fitting these pieces together in a way that enhances our comfort and reduces the amount of musculoskeletal stress on the body. So really good for everybody when we can follow some of these principles of ergonomics. Continue, please. But what is really ergonomic? That's the question. You see all types of things being labeled as ergonomic. Maybe you've seen ergonomic keyboards or chairs or mouse or desks, and, and they all have that label on it. So um, what I want to do is kind of offer a word of caution here is that we don't want to just simply grab at products as solutions. We really want to take a very comprehensive, comprehensive look at everything according to that model I just shared that kind of considers the person, person level factors, what are your physical abilities, the job itself, Laura mentioned essential functions. So what are those as critical aspects that, that you have to be able to perform of those job of that job? And is it a good match for you? And then also the environment, right? So workplaces often, you know, design as a standard environments, for instance, the desk, the chairs, the computer, uh, desktop computers, and so forth to fit most people, right? That's the idea. But you have to remember that we all aren't the same. We're all unique here. And so um, it really is truly not one size fits all. And so a lot of the, the guidance I'll offer today is kind of universally um, good for most people. But also I want you to recognize that uh, you and many other people may require more specialized solutions. And there's a lot of specialty kind of quote unquote ergonomic products out there. Um, but if we can really look at everything, bigger picture, higher level, look at the entire workspace, look at your habits, your routine, um, then we can, we can really, um, with through ergonomics, come up with recommendations that can be very effective. And of course, in the realm of accommodations, that's where we would like to be. Next slide, please. So um, what do we do about ergonomics, right? So how do we reduce or prevent work-related discomforts? And I say reduce or prevent because again, all of us can benefit from this, whether you are trying to manage chronic pain on a daily basis um, or whether you are discomfort free in your work. I think it's important to be in this preventive space because what happens over time is simply wear and tear on the body. And that's um, what ergonomic injuries are. Essentially, it's uh, the, the repetitions that you're performing, the postures that you're working in, the amount of sedentary work that's required of you, the forces and so forth, this can all accumulate. Um, and it often exists on a spectrum. So something that may start as fatigue, escalate into discomfort, and then can turn into disability. Um, and then maybe there's a layer on that for you personally, where you're already dealing with a comorbidity. And so it's maybe a bigger problem and it impacts your work performance more. So what can we do about this? Here's kind of my four-step plan. First is understanding the risks. You can bring in an ergonomist to help you understand risks and job hazards related to your specific work, but there are some kind of cardinal risks here. So working in awkward positions, repetitions, so any activity that's highly repetitive like typing, clicking, scrolling, contact stress, so any area of the soft tissue of the body that's being pressed or coming in contact with a hard or sharp edge, and the use of force, even force of gravity on your body and maintaining any type of position for an extended period of time against the force of gravity. Um, but also of course, clicking force, typing force, so forth. And then what you would do, and what hopefully I can help you do today is start to think about reducing or controlling those risks so they put less stress on the body. This starts with having a better environmental setup. Okay, we start here and rather than kind of trying to start with, oh, I need to work on my posture. So I really want to think an environmental level, you'd be more successful here. So with that, making sure you're using the right tools and devices and that you have a good set of kind of personal habits around your work. Of course, we know as a strategy many of us have learned is um, movement, variation of posture and activity. We see this with standing desks that allows us to move more in some cases, taking more breaks. It's getting the body circulatory system working, removing the waste and the metabolites that build up in the system because of a lot of sedentary postures. So we know this to be a very powerful strategy in, in terms of reducing discomfort. 
And then it won't be the focus today, but I cannot neglect to mention the role of mental health in this picture. So how our stress level, our, um, our mental health, things like depression and anxiety contribute to physical pain. This is well established in the literature. And as many of us know, this can become a cycle. So being able to address um, simply mental health and stress and how that contributes to your physical pain. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to give you some pretty quick guidance on setting up your workstation. So um, if you can jot some notes down or come back to the recording or the slides if you wanna, if you're back in your workstation at another time and you want to try and make some adjustments. I'd like to say that a lot of this is kind of universally good because it's putting you into a more neutral position, which has less stress on the body. But I also want to say that, again, it's not one size fits all. So there's many specialized different types of solutions that are not kind of considered in this, this kind of grand sweep of the workstation I'm going to walk you through first. So when it comes to seat, uh, seating, you want to be well positioned in your chair so that your hips are higher than your knees. That angle of the hips puts less stress on the back and allows more blood flow down to the lower extremities. You might find that when you raise your chairs so that your hips are higher than your knees, that all of a sudden you've lost your foot support. So it's important to have both of those, your hips higher than your knees and your feet supported by the floor or a footrest. You wanna make sure that you have clearance around your body in your chair. So you should have space at the back of the knees equaling about two to four fingers width and space on either side of the hips that's going to eliminate that contact stress to the body. A big thing that I see, maybe if we're not positioned correctly in our chairs or we don't have the right chair, is perching forward. Or maybe you're trying to get your feet on the floor. But you want to aim to support your body because you'll stay more neutral when your spine is supported. So lumbar support is really critical for sitting. Um, it helps you sit actually more relaxed and more neutral. And then when, as far as the armrests, if you happen to have an armrest on your chair, you should adjust them so that they don't cause any upward shrugging or winging out of the arms and elbows so that your shoulders are relaxed and close to your body and that the armrests don't interfere with the desk. Next slide, please. And then of course our work environments are not always perfect and we'll talk more about this, but I wanted to share some kind of common chair dilemma solved or maybe if you're working in an um, outside of the office type of space at a dining chair or so forth. And so this is a little bit of problem solving here you can look at. For instance, if your chair is too low, considering a cushion to sit on top of to raise you up slightly higher, chair too high, maybe resting your feet on a footrest as I mentioned. Um, it's kind of like a Goldilocks type of scenario, right? <laughs> the chair is too deep. Um, I see this a lot too. So if your seat pan doesn't slide, putting something at your back to bring you slightly forward in the chair. And the same goes for if your chair doesn't have great lumbar support, using a lumbar support cushion to support your back, especially if you're sitting in kind of just a, a regular dining chair, for instance. Um, armrests, I mentioned, if they're getting in the way, if they are causing a postural issue, I would recommend removing them, assuming them you don't need them to sit to stand out of the chair. If you have a complicated chair, um, I have a feeling Laura's chair has a lot of paddles and levers associated and you're unsure of what they do. Make sure that you look that up. Look at all the features and, and perks of your chair um, so that you're able to adjust it properly. And of course, as I mentioned, movement breaks is, a, is another alternative, simply getting out of the chair if you're able. Next slide, please. Let's talk about mouse and keyboard. So, so first thing you want to do with the mouse and keyboard after you're kind of positioned well in the chair is make sure that it lines up with your resting elbow level. So really your desk height should be just shy of your resting elbow when it's at your side and your mouse and keyboard should be right there. So you pull the mouse and keyboard close to the body and when your elbows are at your side and you make this kind of sweeping motion, they should be right there. That mouse that Lori had is, is reducing the reach, basically. It's keeping that kind of excessive reaching outward away from the keyboard that causes a lot of stress to the shoulder joint. So that's the idea with that kind of mouse. And so and that is why you want everything kind of close to your body to eliminate the reaching so that your, your elbow is basically stayed at your, or staying at your side. Um, so we can achieve that first by bringing the keyboard back towards us, maintaining that back support, of course. Something I love to teach people is because I just see um, most people not doing this is the float technique with the wrists. So rather than using like wrist pads and wrist guards, you wanna first make sure your chair is at the proper height. So your elbow level with your desk and then practice what's called the floating technique. 
So instead of making contact with the wrist, with the desk, and your wrist is kind of planted on the desk, and that's going to cause you to have a lot of deviation side to side with your wrist, you want to practice hovering or floating so that there's nothing underneath your wrist. There's no contact stress um, and that your wrist is nice and straight while you're using your mouse and keyboard. They should also be on the same level. So occasionally we see kind of a mouse up here, a keyboard down here. They're at the same level. That's going to reduce that reaching, those unnecessary repetitions that cause stress on the joints. Next slide. And of course, we want to use strategies too, because ergonomics is not all about having the perfect setup. We have to think strategically um, about other solutions, especially when you know no amount of having the right setup or position is is alleviating your discomfort, which is a reality for a lot of people. Um, but we do want to make kind of look at these checkpoints as well. So making sure the chair is at the correct height. I said I've said this a few times, but I see people kind of jump to mice as a solution or keyboards, alternative keyboards. And a lot of times what I see is that the, the wrist angle is off because the chair height is off and it, it makes an inch makes a huge difference. Also strategies, maybe you have already implemented because um, because you've had to, that's what I hear from so many of my clients. It's mousing on the non-dominant side to relieve the stress to the dominant side, using those keyboard shortcuts and macros, making sure you take a look at your cursor settings, your, how, how much it takes to scroll, for instance, you can set that as a value. Um, also this idea of breaks, but micro breaks. Advice that I give to a lot of my clients is don't stay actively hovered over your keyboard and mouse during periods of natural um, pauses in your work. And so you want to take this opportunity for more variation instead of keeping your hands ready at the keyboard, rest them down in your lap, relax them down, get them out of that position into a more relaxed position. Next slide, please. Screens, there are definitely some exceptions when it comes to screens, especially if you have a visual impairment. So not all these rules apply to everyone, but generally for most people, the monitor should be placed about an arm's length away and the top third of the screen should be about eye level. Make sure this is the last step in the sequence that you look at in your workstation, because of course, if you're not positioned correctly in your chair, then your screen will also um, you know, not be at the right level until you adjust your chair properly. So when you look straight ahead, your eyebrow should kind of roughly line up with the top of the screen. You also wanna center your screen so that you're not excessively twisting or bending your neck um, in order to view that screen. Next slide. I'm gonna unpack a few accessories here. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I just wanna open your eyes to a few different low tech aids that can really help maintain your body in a more neutral position that's better um, for the musculoskeletal system. Not only that, but also kind of reduce some of the repetitive motion. So more from a joint conservation perspective. So I mentioned a footrest a few times. I find most people that are average or petite stature could really benefit from this as you know what regardless of whether or not they have a disability or a discomfort um, because quite simply your feet don't touch the ground and you're setting yourself up for discomfort and poor posture because of that. A document holder we saw earlier. So this is going to prevent you from constantly looking down and up at your screen if you're referencing documents. Wrist rests, I list them here because they're very popular, but I always say only if they feel comfortable to you. There's no real functional reason to use them if you're positioned correctly and everything in your space is adjusted appropriately. They would only be for comfort. Um, really my preference is to learn that floating hovering technique but I recognize kind of the feeling of support really works for a lot of people. Webcam, uh, really common modern uh, remote work world tools, but a lot of people use the, the webcam on their laptop and then they're referencing a main screen at the same time. And so what you see is this constant kind of diagonal scanning pattern, moving of the neck that you could really reduce your repetitions if you mount that camera kind of right on top of that main screen and use an external webcam. Same thing goes for a headset. Um, so rather than craning your neck to hold the phone, it's of course using a headset or a speaker phone to eliminate that um, awkward position. Next slide. So as I've emphasized, kind of that whole setup checklist that I just walked you through um, is a baseline for most people is going to put your body in a more neutral position. And that's going to put the least amount of stress on the musculoskeletal system. And we can think about this when we're doing activities at home, such as phone use as well, um, or anything that, that falls into that kind of repetitive stress category. And when we look at the body um, and we set up the environment to fit 
you as a unique person is you kind of look like this. The ears are aligned with shoulders and the hips. The arms are close to the body. The shoulders are relaxed. The wrists are nice and straight and the hips are slightly higher than the knees. Actually sitting back in your chair, a little bit of an open hip angle, like 110, 120 degrees is actually good. Um, and that your elbows and your knees are at approximate 90 to 100 degree angles. Next slide. So I call remote work the wild side of ergonomics because sometimes anything goes and we can set ourselves up for um, potential issues if we don't have the right setup at home. And so I want to kind of show you some tips to be resourceful, but also I wouldn't, I would also never discourage you from seeking a uh, higher level of intervention in your home office if you need to through an accommodation. Um, so I'm showing you some hacks, so to speak, but I don't think it's a substitute for a proper setup that is most effective for managing your symptoms. But I tend to use these when I'm traveling, for instance, I can't take my whole ergonomic setup with me. Um, and what you can see here is that if we are familiar with the kind of what the body looks like in a neutral position, we can translate it to those other kind of work scenarios. Um, it's easy enough at the desk where you have maybe external keyboard and mouse and screens, but say you wanna take a break because honestly you need to get away from the desk, you're uncomfortable there and you find yourself comfort in the couch, using the same principles, supporting your back, supporting your feet, keeping your arms relaxed at your sides instead of kind of leaning into a coffee table or something like that. Um, that's a lap desk. So you can use an external mouse, for instance. And then at the dining table, you can use anything to raise a laptop screen. And I'll mention that laptops are one of the bigger contributors to discomfort when we rely on those for prolonged periods of work. They really cause a lot of neck discomfort because you cannot win as far as neutral postures. So you wanna make that separation, travel or use a, a external mouse and keyboard. And you can see some of the chair hacks on this one. Again, not a suitable substitution for your permanent work setup, but a good go-to when, when you need to work in this scenario and you're looking for kind of found objects to increase your comfort. Next slide. So digital nomads, try this, not that. So let's look at some pictures here where you can see now that you're a pro at identifying neutral and awkward postures, kind of, you know, how this gentleman, Exhibit A, how his neck and his wrist might start to develop some discomfort, right? But you can see Exhibit B, that's a more neutral position, more supported position. Here you can see the same thing. And these are ways that most of us, or a lot of us, work every single day and that is causing a lot of stress to the body. Contact stress, you can see the arm kind of planted on the desk there. We want to avoid that. So um, I'm not saying that, you know, you should always work at your desk. I think there has to be some type of flexibility. Um, you have to listen to your body when you need to change kind of position and space. The best thing to do is to have strategies for better ergonomics when you have to do that and put a limit on it. Don't let it be your all day long work scenario because you'll be um, just overall more ergonomic at a, a kind of compute, traditional computer workstation setup. Next slide. Okay, we're going to shift gears and I wanna share a little bit about kind of more dynamic work. So work that is not desk bound, for instance, it's more movement based. And so we can think about um, people that work in warehouses or grocery stores or in the medical field and you're much more on your feet. And so what is some kind of key takeaways in terms of body mechanics? How do we maintain better postures and positions and habits around more the movement oriented job? Um, and there's a lot to offer here, but I wanna give you a few cute, uh, key takeaways. If you don't work in a movement oriented job, these are also uh, tips for life. So tips for housework um, and you know childcare and pet care and so forth. And body mechanics are really important. And this is when I, in my clinical days, we used to teach so many body mechanics for our patients coming off different spine surgeries and hip surgeries, and just um, introducing this idea of joint conservation and energy conservation with that. So basically unsafe or unsafe movement behaviors develop over time. And not to any fault of our own, it's kind of just a natural consequence of being a modern human and, you know, living in this modern age that's not as movement oriented as it used to be, right, until the industrial era and even more so um, in the past five, 10 years, right? And so we kind of develop into these movement patterns where we develop patterns of muscle tightness and weakness that contribute to poor, poor body mechanics. But it's not too late to kind of work on this and learn some of these 
to, to protect your body. Next slide. So um, I'm not going to go too far into all of the functional movements, but this would be a, a webinar all to itself. But there are basically seven functional movements that is the basis for all movements of humans. And they are listed here, squat, hinge, lunge, push, pull, twist, and locomotion. Um, and so we, there are some common kind of threads with these movements. It has to do with neutral postures and alignment and engaging your core and, you know, um, all of these things. But I, I listed here a blog you can read, and there's a lot of other kind of resources you can read from re reputable sources on the internet. So you can dive a little bit deeper into kind of what these should look like when we do these day to day and how we can improve this from a biomechanics perspective in protecting our joints. But I'll share just a few tips related to these. So we'll go to the next slide. One thing I love to teach because it's just so functional for everybody, no matter what, is bending over. So the hip hinge, this is really powerful in protecting your back specifically. Um, again, most of us tend to bend at the spine because we've just naturally developed that pattern over the course of time. And what we want to move towards in protecting our back and our spine is, is performing a hip hinge every time you bend over. So it could be bending over in your seat. It could be bending over the sink to brush your teeth. It's bending over to buckle the child in the car seat, bending over to unload the dishwasher. I mean, it happens hundreds of times a day for a lot of us, I would think. Um, and so no matter kind of how deep the bend is, the idea of letting that movement come from your hips, sometimes it comes from the knees when you get lower down, but not bending at the spine when you bend over. And there's a really great article you can look up to if you just Google the lost art of bending over. I think NPR did a, a story on that and it kind of walks you through some different videos and kind of shows how we lost the hip hinge over time. And again, owing to just us being modern humans in a, in a um, more sedentary age. And I, I just find it fascinating. So if there's one takeaway from this session, it's uh, practice your hip hinge and perfect it to protect your back. Next slide, please. Another thing to protect our back with movement is minimizing twisting. So I always teach my clients to step with your feet and pivot with your feet rather than twist at the back. You want to avoid both of those. So bending at the spine, twisting at the spine, both put pressure on the spinal disc and can cause an to a lot of injuries. Um, and again, many of my clients over the years have told me, oh, I don't do that. I can't do that, right? They've learned it the hard way. And so to be proactive um, is always better, right? Next slide. Lifting and moving objects, keeping the weight close to the body, keeping that alignment of the ears, shoulders, and hips when you're moving objects. Again, you can see the example of the hip hinge and a bit of a squat here as well. Um, this is a great example of that functional movement into practice and perfecting that along with your alignment so that you're protecting your body as much as possible when you're doing these activities. Next slide. And just some summary tips to avoid fatigue or stiffness on the job. And so these are kind of things, that off, we offer these to advice, this advice to employers who are looking to implement different programs, whether it's uh, body mechanics training or a warm-up program, but again, universally kind of good for most people and also, it doesn't really matter what kind of work you do. Let's face it, we all face fatigue every now and again, and a lot of us stiffness as well. First is something I've covered a lot during this talk, and that's working and moving in neutral positions. Second is warming up before work. So um, briskly kind of moving the body according to your tolerance, performing a job-specific stretch or warm-up program to get your blood flowing, again, to kind of nourish those areas of the body through oxygenated blood that are getting stressed or that are prone to stress. Changing positions frequently. Again, variation is the key every 30 minutes is really powerful. I mentioned micro breaks. So taking more during your natural pauses in work, taking that as an opportunity to change position, whether or not that means getting out of the chair if you're seated. It could be as simple as resting your hands in the lap. Hydration is really important for injury prevention. So this is the mechanism that lubricates our joints um, and is, is something I think is pretty understated in injury prevention. So stay hydrated. And then also along the lines of the first part of the talk, report your discomfort or issues early, get them addressed. Um, don't be shy to ask, you know, there's not all employers require employees to go through the accommodations process to get an ergonomic assessment. You know, it doesn't mean it, it's, a, it's a great option and, and some employers indeed require it, but it's also okay to ask, can I have an ergonomic assessment? Do you have anybody who can help me with ergonomics here? Um, next slide, please. 
Lastly, if you do, if you are going the route of ADA accommodations and it is ergonomic in nature, my best advice to you would be to request an ergonomic assessment. What I see mostly is, and, and this is totally fine, but the doctor may write a note for a sit-stand desk, or you may come to your employer and say, I need a standing desk. And that's, yes, that is true. Um, and because you are the person that knows yourself the best, right? But also take the adva take advantage of looking bigger picture at the entire workstation. There could be some critical missing pieces and other pieces of equipment that can be brought in that can really help you from an ergonomic standpoint. So just taking that really comprehensive book look. Um, and that will, I think, prove to be just more effective. That in addition to, again, maybe trying to bring in a third party consultation. So the bias isn't there as well. Next and last slide. Thank you so much. That was a really fast version of Ergonomics 101. I hope that you had some strategies that you could take away and try. Also, again, with that disclaimer, it's not one size fits all. So it's very possible that many of us need specialized ergonomic needs. And you can do that through a um, skilled, trained ergonomics professional. You can check us out at theraisingworkplace.com. You can follow us on all the social medias. And we routinely put out like tips for all different types of activities. So if you want to stay current with ergonomics, please check us out and feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weiner, and thank you, Laura. Um, we are going to open things up right now for a Q&A session. Um, and Robin, I believe um, folks are going to be putting those questions in the Q&A. And... We've also got some that are um, that were sent in ahead of time, and um, I'm hoping Laura and and Dr. Weiner can help with these. Um, what about requesting accommodations for future needs? For example, my arthritis is in remission, but I do have periodic flares. It's hard to request when my disease is invisible, so to speak. Oh, so that's a hard one. Um, what I recommend is having um, is having a plan in place with your employer um, so that they are aware that you, so if you know that you have periodic flares, you could have a plan in place so that when you do flare, they you have, you've prepared for it. So you could have, you know, whatever your needs are. If you need to have a later start time, if you need to have, um, um, you know, a better chair there, don't forget, um, just as Nikki mentioned there, you know, you can also make sure that your workspace is set up ergonomically to meet your needs then if you do have a flare or could even prevent a flare, because most of us know that it's when we're doing all those things that we shouldn't do when we're not sitting properly, when we're putting all that extra stress. So we could actually be, you know, helping to cause a flare to start because we're not being careful with our joints. So if you can prevent an injury or prevent, you know, wear and tear on some of those things that may just make it easier. But I, I do recommend working, you know, you have a condition that is known to flare. So you could go to your HR and set up, okay, if I flare, what can we put in place so that I can continue working? Um, Dr. Weiner, this one might be um, well suited for you. What are your thoughts regarding the spinal twist poses and asanas in yoga? Um, supine, seated, and standing twists. Yeah. So the the twist, precaution with twisting should be universally followed when there's a force involved. Like if you're carrying a box or a weight or you're picking up a child or transferring a patient or something like that, um, that is when you really want to avoid the twist. So the yoga poses, I, everything, of course, to tolerance, we're all different. If we experience discomfort when we do those activities, that's a cue. Maybe we shouldn't do them. But if you do that discomfort free and there's no force on the body involved, meaning you're not holding something um, while you're twisting, that would be the, I think, the way to approach that. So I'm, I'm not saying those poses are bad and they can be, I think, very good for a lot of people working on their spinal mobility. Just make sure that your body mechanics are correct and that you're not experiencing discomfort. Um, one, another one that came through, can we request fit supported for our feet at work? Um, 
I'm assuming that's a fit test um, for our feet at work. Um, I'm assuming they're referring to a foot rest to have at work and um, yes, I mean, if, if I'm assuming it correctly, um, um, but yeah, a foot rest would be part of, you know, and, and Nikki talked about foot rest as an ergonomic feature, um, but they're really inexpensive. They're like 30 to $40. So it would be a very inexpensive accommodation. Um, and we did answer this one in the Q&A, but um, Laura, you're very well suited for this one. What about accommodations for a compromised immune system due to medications um, TNF blockers, et cetera, um, and general dangers of exposure in a, in a cubicle environment. So I ran into this myself with, with COVID. I went home a week before the rest of my coworkers did because it was getting worse and worse. Um, and I was taking humor off. Um, so we've, COVID has shown, proved that people can work from home and um, everybody, you know, all these companies were able to provide the um, ways to do it. So that number one, that would be the biggest one, the easiest for you to, to stay healthy and not be exposed to things. Other things you can do with a cubicle environment. Um, my workplace, um, when I did return, um, I returned for my mental health because I was struggling being home so long. Um, and so they rerouted the um, walking paths so that no one had to walk by my cubicle. I had an air purifier that I actually purchased um, because my employer was so good about accommodating me. Um, so it's mine. Um, so I ran a HEPA filter um, and my the two managers on my floor just, um, they couldn't divulge anyone's health status, but they did both let me know that everyone that all of their employees that they knew of were vaccinated. So that made me feel a little bit better. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, you gotta be careful, but um, work from home is really, and they can't bulk like they used to because we know they can do it. Um, and before I move on to one for Nikki, this one's a bit related um, for your experience, uh, Laura. This, um, Karen asks, my workplace is an open workplace where there are no assigned seats and just workstations. Do you have any experiences with this scenario and how to get some of these accommodations when you don't have an assigned work area? I guess my brain goes to why can't they give you an assigned area? Um, because you do need these accommodations and yeah. it's not preferential treatment, it's leveling the playing field. And so they, there should be no reason why they couldn't set aside a space that would be reserved for your work hours um, to use when you're there. I was thinking the same thing. Um, for Dr. Wiener, um, accommodation recommendations for the car or driving and for those who have to stand for long periods of time. Absolutely. So a lot of the same principles of seating apply to the car. And actually, Lori mentioned this driving in a in a SUV that sits your hips higher than your knees. It can be really terribly uncomfortable and stressful to the joints to spend extended periods of time where the knees are higher than the hips in something like a lower vehicle or a coupe or something like that. Um, back support. Um, following kind of the ergonomic principles of driving, a huge part of this is um, taking more breaks. So maybe stopping every 30 to 60 minutes for a quick movement break um, and, and making sure that your vehicle is adjusted so that it can meet your specific needs. As far as standing, again, it comes down to variation of posture. So prolonged standing means you probably need to take a seated break. Um, they make things like industrial leaning stools, where if you're I think about like a cash register that's used for a standing position, but it's not really the kind of space where you would pull up a full on task chair, something that's called a leaning stool. You can kind of off weight your body and use that. Um, so it, I think it does have to do with breaking up in both cases, those static postures with a variation in posture and using an equipment or a different uh, modification of the environment in order to get there. You're making me pay attention to my posture just listening to you. So <laughs> um, this question is for Laura. Can my employer terminate my employment by telling me that they can no longer fulfill my job requirements? Um, 
I think what they mean is that they can no longer accommodate my 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 limitations. I'm a nurse and I try to push through every day despite pain and fatigue. Um, well, what have they done to accommodate you, first off? Um, have they, you know, tried different, um, uh, either taking long, taking breaks spread throughout the day, using, you know, being able to sit when you're doing your, um, doing your patient notes? Um, are they, you know, I, it, without knowing your exact needs and what they're, what they've done, I can't really say. What I would do is recommend, um, you check with that Ask Jan org and utilize them as a uh, resource you can call you can explain um, your situation what your employer's done and they'll give you their um, best advice based on the laws and um, what they know seeing as they work for the government so you know it's it's they could probably they could encourage you to apply for disability um, but I guess, you know, if it's physically too demanding and it's a health network, then they could look at transitioning you into a position that would be easier on you physically. And that's, that's a good call. I know I used to work in an acute setting and we had many of those different conversations with some of our bedside RNs in terms of finding a more appropriate role for them that was less demanding, um, on, on their body. Um, Dr. Weiner, you mentioned reducing repetition being helpful for achieving an ergonomic setup, but isn't movement ultimately also helpful for reducing pain? That's a really that's a really good point. And so it basically has to do with when we're talking repetition, you're using the same muscle groups and body areas on repeat. Um, and so you're kind of like, for example, if you're typing, you're, 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 it's stress to the muscles and the joints and the ligaments and the tendons that are moving your fingers to type. Whereas when you're getting up to take a movement break, it's a much more dynamic activity. And, and when you're moving, for example, in an instance of a micro break, you're getting out of that repetitious posture. You're doing the opposite thing. So you can think about this as um, when movement is good, is kind of the counterbalance to the bad movement, if that makes sense. And when the movement is bad, it's highly repetitive using the same body area on repeat. It's a great point. Um, this one can be for either Laura or Dr. N Dr. Wiener. Do any accommodations come to mind for those of us who travel, flying, staying in hotels, et cetera, for work? Um, this person says that they typically travel five to eight work days per month. Oh, um, well, I mean, I mentioned if I have to drive more than three hours, uh, they have me stay overnight. So I'm not doing like a six hour round trip in one day. Um, use advanced seating on the airlines if you need to, so that you can get to your seat. Um, practice stretches. I'm sure um, Dr. Wiener has got a really good a bunch of recommendations on, on how, what you can do. Um, I know I can't sit at an airport um, for very long. I'll sit for 20 minutes and then I just take my suitcase and I walk around um, because I know I'm going to be sitting on the plane for quite a while. Um, you know, making sure that you allow plenty of travel time so that you can rest. Um, and that, that can be an accommodation. Uh, the employer might balk at that one. I can't really, uh, you know, but the, the key thing is that, you know, you, you're not overtaxing your body. Um, if you can um, move, you know, when you're in a hotel, um, walk in the pool, um, make sure that you're getting lots of movement in. That's, it's, you know, not going to hurt you. Um, but I really don't know per se about how, you know, if that's an essential part of your job to travel, um, you know, just make the most, the most of it with traveling wisely. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wiener, do you have any posture or ergonomic recommendations for dual monitors? Yes. So mm -hmm. you, you want to designate your primary monitor first. Most always there's one we use a little bit more. Center that one with your body, mouse and keyboard, and then put the se secondary monitor, the one you use slightly less, right touching it next to it on your dominant side, angled in about 30 degrees so that you're reducing the turning radius of the neck. So they should both be raised and there shouldn't be a gap in between them. 
if you equally use the monitors, 50-50, just put them together where your nose is, basically, where um, they should meet where your nose is. Um, and another one um, that I will shout out to you, um, Dr. Weiner. any tips for somebody with STT joint arthritis that works typing most of the time? Yeah, there are, I think, several different solutions as far as typing, a big one being dictation software or speech-to-text options. That's becoming more and more accessible. I feel like it used to be incredibly expensive, and you had to install things on your computer, and now there's many just browser type of um, solutions where you can experiment with um, some or all of the time speech-to-text. Also, they make all different types of alternative keyboards that put your hands in a more neutral position and keyboards that take a little bit less force when you're typing. Um, and so exploring a keyboard that could be more split or um, uh, tented in style, the goal there is to keep your wrist in a more uh, uh, neutral position. That in addition to using your keyboard shortcuts. Very cool. I have a couple for Laura. Um, is there a limit to the amount of accommodations that you can request? Um, no, uh, there's not a limit to the number that you can request. Um, it might, if they're, if they are expensive accommodations, your employer might hit on that undue hardship, um, as far as the expense of it all. So, um, the key thing is how, you know, working together with your employer um, and it's going to be what your needs are and what they can provide as well while you're still performing the essential functions of your job, which I know is hard with a progressive condition. Um, you know, I know that the day is going to come when I'm not going to be able to work anymore um, and I'm going to retire earlier than most people do um, because of that. And so you just really have to gauge what you're capable of doing and if you're really able to perform that job, and I can't tell you when that when that happens, it's going to be different for everyone. Um, and another one for you, Laura. Um, for those of us in sales, taking downtime or using accommodations like taking time off during a flare-up can impact our ability to meet quotas. Any recommendations on how to approach this? Oh. <laughs> I work for the state. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. Um, I think really learning to manage your disease and paying attention to your body and its signs of when you might be flaring and learning what can you do so that you can prevent or slow that. Um, this is really, I think, something because... I came down with my, I was diagnosed so young. I've been able to really learn to accept what my body can and can't do and when I'm gonna push it too far and it's gonna push me into a flare. So work with your rheumatologist, make sure that you're well controlled. Um, you know, I know some people bulk at taking the biologics and, and other drugs. Um, I personally, they've changed my life. They've changed my daughter's life. She also has juvenile arthritis um, and she works full time. She graduated from college and she works full time and, and she's doing it. But you have to learn what can I do to help slow things? What can I do that's going to help me do what I want to do longer? Um, as far as sales, I mean, if you can do like shorter days every day, um, so that you're in, you're working every day, but then you're not, um, you know, pushing it eight to 10 hours a day, um, but you're still available. Um, and you have those set hours that you can be contacted. Um, I, I don't know if you can find like a resource group of people who work in sales and deal with chronic illness and they can help. I don't know. And I, I wish I could tell you more. Thank you. Um, for Dr. Weiner. Um, this person says, I have a bad hip, which locks when I sit too long. My job requires a lot of sitting. What exercises do you recommend at work to help stretch my hip and leg throughout the day? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I will be cautious about providing specific guidance around stretches without your the supervision or direction of your medical provider. But I will say that that's a, a, it's this idea that when you're sitting, your hip flexor is shortened. You think of it like as a band. And then when you stand, it lengthens. So the problem many of us have 
is that you're staying in that shortened position and that's kind of escalating your pain or locking up your hip. And so I think the idea and the general recommendation would be to lengthen. So you wanna stretch your hip flexors and you can do that by standing um, and some other different stretches that you could do under the guidance of a physical therapist or um, somebody who, who's worked with you before. Thank you. Um, Laura, this one's for you. Um, and I, and I know I can tweak on this one a little bit too. I have multiple diagnoses. How should I go about requesting help without making it seem like I'm incapable of doing my job? And I will quickly say from an HR perspective, your employer is not entitled to know your diagnosis. Um, what your employer should be working with you on is what your accommodations are, what your needs are. So, um, it, it, that that's just from my perspective, and I always sort of you know make sure I don't need to know the why; I need to know the what. So, but Laura, I'll let you take that. And, and that's exactly right, Shannon. That's that's really the key of it is what do they need to know? Um, how it, is it directly impacting you doing your job? Um, so a lot of those may overlap, um, and but it's what do you need? Um, you know, I just got a. Uh, hearing loss diagnosis. And so now they're, um, I had my computer settings changed so that I can stream my volume on my computer directly to my hearing aids. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so it's, it's not that um, they can only, will only accommodate one thing, but what is it that you need? And it may be hearing related. It may be vision related. It may be um, physical. It may be that you get sick easily because we have immune systems that don't work pro properly. Um, so, you know, you're, you're one whole person and everything impacts you. And so what is it that impacts your job? So, you know, like Shannon said, don't worry so much about the diagnoses, but what is it that you need so that you can do your job as best as you can? And, and if you've ever seen a, an FMLA request form from the De Department of Labor, nowhere does it say, what is your diagnosis? Um, so when you're working with your providers and your HR departments, um, again, it's about what do you need, um, not about the reasons why that are behind it. So um, hopefully that helps. Um, and for Dr. Weiner, ergonomic tips for someone who uses a laptop and a monitor. I actually have a laptop and two monitors in front of me and I just keep my laptop closed. But uh, what kind of tips do you have for that kind of setup? Okay, so if you are not keeping your laptop closed, decide, are you using your laptop keyboard or are you, are you using the screen? Try not to use both. So if you like to use the keyboard, turn the screen off and then use your external monitor and then you're going to be positioned as ergonomic as possible. Um, otherwise, what you wanna do is you plug in an external mouse and keyboard. I would recommend this too for anybody doing the travel thing, maybe having a remote work kit that goes with you where you plug in the external mouse and keyboard and then use a laptop riser or a stack of books or a box to raise the screen so that the top third is eye, eye level. Um, you can use many different found objects to raise a screen, but it might also be handy to just have a laptop riser that's adjustable so you can get that just right fit. Um, so would caution you against trying to use the screen, laptop, keyboard, trackpad, and an external monitor. It would be deciding kind of which is best for your ideal work situation. Very cool. Um, and this is the last question, and this is for um, um, both Laura and Dr. Weiner. Um, what is the one piece of advice you'd like to leave um, for folks that are on the webinar today? Oh, I need the Jeopardy theme playing in the background. <laughs> I can go. I can. I'll go ahead and go. So I just through ergonomics, you can work smarter, not harder. So you want to, there are many things that you can do that are very effective for protecting your body against potential stress. Um, so if you identify a hazard in your workspace, speak up. There are things that can be done that really help everybody. Um, so again, your personal needs can be met through ergonomics potentially, but also again, if you identify things in your workplace that would help everybody, bring it up. It's really powerful in terms of um, helping to manage discomfort. And I suppose my, the one thing that I would like people to take is that you do have um, protections under the law and document, document, document um, all of your communications and asking for this. M many employers are amazing. And, you know, I, I work for the state government specifically because I knew that they 
were amazing uh, when it came to accommodations. Um, but ask for what you need and don't be afraid of that. Um, and if they don't want to do it, then there are processes to um, hold them accountable. Um, but, you know, the whole thing is that we, as people who have chronic health conditions, um, that we are productive, contributing citizens for as long as we are capable of doing so. Um, and, and that, and that's, we all just want to be valuable and, and to give back. Um, so, you know, there's ways to do it. And if you're, if your workplace is totally uncooperative, document it. If you want to do something about it, there are routes to do it. If not find a place that is and find a place because you are valuable and you make a difference. And, you know, if you're given the right resources, you can do a great job. Fantastic. Um, Laura and Dr. Weiner, thank you both so much um, for lending your time and expertise tonight. Um, I know I'm I'm already trying to fix my posture and re looking at my monitor, um, just listening to you. So um, I've, I've definitely learned some myself tonight. Um, before we sign off for the night, um, I just a reminder that we have do have several resources and events um, to help you um, manage your arthritis. Um, we do have the Live Live Yes Connect groups. The Foundations Connect groups are a great way to get support and learn more about positive coping strategies to maintain to manage arthritis and your mood. Groups meet in person or online, and you can visit us there at connectgroups.arthritis.org for more information on how to join a community that understands you. We do have webinars. There's a whole bunch um, coming up as well. Um, the foundation offers free webinars every month hosted by nationally recognized leaders in arthritis care. And you can go to our website at arthritis.org slash webinars to register and learn more about these. Um, one of my favorite events of the year, the Jingle Bell Run is coming up. Um, join a team to help fundraise for uh, funds for your cure. And you can check out that page on arthritis.org backslash JBR. Um, podcasts, we have more tips and real talk about arthritis from experts and patients who understand it best. Arthritis.org backslash podcast. We do have a helpline. The foundation's trained staff can help you navigate arthritis challenges from treatment questions to insurance questions and more. Um, and that is that link is there for you as well. And as a reminder, in a few days, you will receive a survey asking about your experience here on this webinar tonight. Please take the time to fill out the survey completely and honestly so that we can best serve your needs in the future. Thank you all again so, so much for joining us tonight. Take care and have a great evening.